Okay. Hey, Sasha. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for invitation to be part of this podcast. Thanks to you for joining us. I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, we have a lot in common. Uh, we speak a lot about sustainability, ESGs, efficiency. Um, I would love to know more about you. Let's get started. Oh, please let us know. Okay. Thank you. Answer. Thank you. And it, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to participate in a podcast and actually meet you and speak to you. Uh, I've been working with the sustainable finance investments for 20 plus years, and I started my career as a war correspondent. I'm a journalist and economist by profession. So I spent time uh, reporting for uh, Swedish newspapers uh, a couple of years, and then I went on to work for uh, multinational oil corporations around the world to manage to help them manage the environmental and social issues on the ground. So I spent time in Africa and former Soviet Union in many different places. And uh, eventually I ended up in a finance and I've been trying to uh, use financial toolbox for years and, and shift the way how it's used to contribute more to address externalities that it impacts uh, through the capital flows. I mean, through the investments that are done globally. So um, I'm, I'm, I've been doing, I've been, I used to say to people, I've been playing the same football game for the last 20 plus years, and it's always the same players. It's a, it's the same. I mean, I've been, you know, sometimes winning the game, but most of the times losing the game. Yeah. Right. Right. I agree. Um, in one of your uh, pieces recently, um, you, you tackle the challenges that have been, uh, Based and and over the past couple of years, with thanks to I mean due to COVID and um, how I'm I'm really curious about how you see the world within the next five to ten years. Uh, what's what's the biggest challenge for us? You know, the world is it's all always uh, shifting and changing. We are always on a junction somewhere, going somehow. Uh, I think what you can clearly see is that uh, <clears throat> there is a Lot, a lot more polarization happening right now. Uh, and I think on if you look at this sort of sustainability investment space, this movement of sustainability in the investment space have been growing for the last, I'd say, three to four years, very exponentially. So you have a lot of assets coming in, a lot of capital being invested in this way. However, when this has happened, what you can also see that the level of greenwashing and, and the hot air is also increasing. There is a lot of uh, promises, a lot of pledges, and you can see that from 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 COP in Glasgow and many other places. I mean, if you follow the markets, it, it still uh, the industry has a big difficulties to. Uh, so what you can see is that the, the world is a, on a bit of a sort of an interesting trajectory because you have huge amounts of capital that are pledged and committed to attack or challenge the climate uh, emergency and uh, be uh, channeled in a way to address these challenges. In the same way, you can clearly see that this is a very much a marketing and PR exercise because in the reality, what you have is that you have an increase of CO2 emissions. You have still a lot of financing in a way that it's, it's by no means contributing to sustainability. And you have this short-term thinking uh, on the in the investment industry that is contributing to actually create this what I call a green bubble or you know uh, uh, some kind of a uh, imaginary uh, ESG or imaginary sustainability effect of this because right now in the world as we are I've been doing this for so many years we still have difficulties to sell our clients what do they actually get when they invest in sustainable funds what what is the outcome what is the tangible thing yeah, I see a lot of uh, big banks, corporate banks, uh, getting into the ESGs in a format that they address the supply chain biases, the decision makers, probably much more on the on the last mile. And I and I do believe that there is a huge amount of work. I'm I'm in that field, of course, and trying to do great job technology for that. But my question here is, how can we today? Um, bridge in between what the investor investment um, positioning today, which has a lack of tools, uh, a lack of understanding, a lack of leveraging technology for that those purposes. And, and the other side, I mean, the efforts can be um, unlimited because in terms of investment, we do have money. Um, and it's not the last, but we have a lot of challenges, local challenges. 
I mean, Africa. I, I don't. I don't think we have a lack of capital. I completely agree with you. I think we have a lack. Of, of channeling and also focus on this capital. So if you think about transition, so we know, for instance, that our energy dependency on fossil mix around the world is still going to be up to 66% by 2050, which is something that we need to address. So how do we channel capital into the innovative solutions uh, now so we can get this shift much faster? And it's it's it all boils down, I think, to the, the, the topic that I like to speak about, and that's incentive models. So the financial industry and market economy, as we know it today, our current system is is structured in a way that incentive models for, for investments, for instance, are very short term uh, related. So it's a tragedy of horizon, but it's also a tragedy of ESG, because many of the sustainability aspects that you want to integrate when you want to invest will most certainly give you some kind of a result between three to seven years. And this is something that market is actually not, fun in, in, it's not functioning in that way. So it means that the, the people are some, somehow having a bit of a false expectation on, on ESG as something that in a very short period of time could channel and transform these companies, which is not true because in most of the cases you need much longer period of time how can we create the right vehicles in, a, in such a short time that we have? Because we don't have any time left, you know, by 2030, I heard, I can hear, you know, 1.5 degrees. W what type of vehicles can we deploy on one side as corporate and on the, on the other side as small businesses? What, what, what could be the innovation here that would revolutionize, you know, the market? I think the innovation in the financial industry uh, needs to happen very quickly, and that is on the type of the vehicles that can be utilized, but also on the on the sort of um, the format of these vehicles. So, you know, in many cases, you will have, uh, for instance, I mean, you need to deploy uh, more regional focused ESG investments with a, with a regional spe special issues that need to be addressed, being that Middle East or Asia or Southeast Asia or Africa. So uh, instead of having this sort of a global approach, I think the future in many ways will be much more regional, much more focused. We need to go in depth. So we need to provide uh, a, almost like a public private uh, partnership. It could be, you know, SDG ETFs, it could be different kinds of funds that are much more focused, smaller and actively managed that you get much more outcome driven um, investments based on this that you can actually evaluate if the investors just to give you an example, if you would invest in small medium sized enterprises being that private equity or listed equity in certain parts of the world, you can actually get leverage both financially but also on the ESG side because you improve capacity of these companies to manage certain risk. And that is something that is not present right now, most of the ESG offering that you have on the fund investment side is actually on a global European, uh, maybe to some extent very limited on, in, on the Asian side. And that is creating a lot of uh, uh, overvaluation of these of these stocks and companies. So if you look at the 10 largest uh, ESG funds in the world, most of them share the same names. I mean, 10 biggest names are the same. And these companies are overvalued from ESG perspective, not creating any tangible difference on the ground, and this is something that needs to change. So public-private is also interesting. Imagine the situation like um, in Israel or in Sweden, where the government will launch the, the, the SDG uh, SPACs or SDG ETFs, enabling transition of the, of the capital and channeling of the capital to small, medium-sized companies where they actually really need help to do that. That will be um, a new way of looking at it. Indeed, indeed. Um, I was I was chatting earlier this week with some former corporate head of sustainability, um, debating on how to manage ESGs and and probably you know the the, the smallholders uh, of you know part of the stocks or assets whatever. Um, and and I do believe that the white public wants to put you know some efforts. Um, but the thing is that I I. I still see that we don't have the venues ready for that um, in terms of platforms, in terms of you know exchanges, in terms of choices, actually. Um, and, and you're so you're so right about this. And, and yeah. But it's also what you can also see. I can give you one interesting sort of a, a data point, which is just 
came out this week in Sweden is that Sweden is one of the most mature ESG markets in the world because the ESG has been here for such a long time. But the literacy, financial literacy of the people that are in Sweden about the impact of, the, of, of ESG, I mean, sustainability in their savings and investments is so limited. So there is a disconnect and people need both information and transparency and ability to see what, they, what the investments can actually cost contribute to and that's not the case today we don't have i mean we still like that all over the world this is not only you know in in general terms everywhere yeah right i i do believe that europe is far away from uh reaching out the the, the purpose and the, and the goals that they've been uh debating on during cop 26 all over the world it's like it's like um i mean it's it's uh, yeah, for my for my part, I think that they have a, a lot of paradoxes over there and uh, a lot of uh, efforts to in, to involve. But I see a lot of employees uh, in different types of groups of a, of a focus on the employees um, and and the different types of providers, you know, surrounding the um, the main uh, corporations and the third parties. And and I do believe that you know employees can um, actually team up with other companies. To create, you know, yeah. opportunities to invest in sustainability, and and the point here is that I I don't see that acceleration uh, coming up, you know, anytime soon if we can't you know, the public-private um, bridge. You're right about that because there is this connect most of the investors think that most of the people that don't know the industry they think that we as investors invest in technical solution in products in value chains we actually invest in people and we invest in people's capacity and ability to transform ideas into tangible results so the quality of people in cooperation with the people and employees in these companies is extremely important i completely agree with you yeah you know i see a lot of a lot of uh, vips you know great name from Great names from you know the the, the, the public the I mean celebrities like Bono you know Charles Theron uh, Leonardo DiCaprio investing in foundations um, and and trying to approach the public in a in a very different way and and you know uh, the industrial average um, replies only by pouring money that is out from the stocks um, mm. benefits that they make. But it doesn't mean that you know there is any type of financial system that controls that or manage that. Um, mm. and, I, and every year, uh, every season, holiday season, actually, as now, um, is 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 a subject to investment, you know, and great announcement on the PR. Don't you think that it's greenwashing uh, a bit too much? Of course, <laughs> of course, there is a huge level of greenwashing in this because. It's also the long-term accountability for these investments that is very important. But it's in what what sort of from the point that where I am, I think you can see you will see a lot of greenwashing because there is a conflict. Of, of these targets somewhere oh, that based this based on growth and consumption at the same time you have these sustainability goals and climate challenges and there is a conflict embedded in this and this is something that we are really trying to avoid speaking about and that goes back to go it goes back to paris it goes back to copenhagen and all of these conferences around the world we are not talking about the fact that the, the system that we run i mean including what you're talking about now is the system that actually does not offer a, a true opportunity to to shift things in a, in a real sense, because it's just just reallocating marginal resources in order to be able uh, to, to get acknowledgement that it's doing something. And, and I completely agree with you. It's, it's a lot of greenwashing, yeah. Do you think that COP26 impacted democracy in a very honest way? Yeah, I think it does, because I think it does. And I think the reason for that is that I think many people around the world are disappointed, disappointed with the outcome, and they are also disappointed with the fact that the politicians that are supposed to, uh, you know, provide guidance and vision for the future are not able to do that. And uh, I think it's posing a lot of question on, on um, um, you know, how democracy will be prevailed going forward forward in in this context where you have you know liberal democracies and the growth-based economic systems are, are very 
tightly connected with each other. So when you start challenging, you know, the, the, the growth-based economic model, then the, you, you also start challenging some of the democratic institutions and how they're built. So it's, it's a very, uh, very dangerous road uh, that we can be uh, in front of. And uh, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very risky thing. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I would push further about, you know, the freedom and, and democracy on that side, because uh, what I see is that we're endangering, you know, on one side, the, the average uh, peace that we have. I mean, if we can call it peace, you know, on a global scale, but on the other side, I mean, we have to take actions and these, these actions are mostly taken by, um, you published actually that graph the other day that I loved, that we see, you know, the big companies, the big countries, sorry. Um, that are deciding, you know, for the smaller countries, and this is a danger. Yes. You know. In terms of yeah, I, I think it's a danger because it's posing a question that, you know, who's accountable for uh, for some of these things? I mean, let's be honest about that. The Western liberal way of living and uh, CO two emissions and, and impact on climate created on the back of that is it's far more heavy on the on this planet than what people are doing in most developing countries including one of the some of the countries that are pointed out as as villains like china or india um, and that sort of a it's also i think it the narrative is very important because of power and with the with a liberal market economy system that they're controlling the narrative and by controlling the narrative they're also controlling who's responsible and i don't think that picture is, is true i think it's false and i think it's also creating wrong expectations so uh, we need to start looking at the world as it is and then we can have different disagreements on you know who's doing what but i think we need to have a much more balanced way of looking uh looking at the way how the sort of a core responsibility is allocated do you think that the the private finance uh, of 130 trillion uh, climate debt can be trusted by the by the by the banks that have been participating in that um, in that alliance that we heard? Let yeah, I, I, I think it's very vague. I mean, you had an article in New York Times that I posted on Twitter actually uh, not so not so long before this call, where the uh, it's a front page of the New York Times today. It says that bankers hijacked the climate talks uh, in Glasgow, and the reason is and the reason is that most of these commitments, uh, however um, ambitious and and uh, fantastic they sound are quite vague in terms of what they are supposed to deliver so uh, you have uh, um, a good question on this in terms of you know how credible these things are we we don't know yet because you know you and i will be uh, most likely uh, very old by 2050 and uh, who will hold these companies accountable i don't know um i mean i i, I do believe that um we have to take responsibility on the, on the local, um, I mean, at, at the local scale, instead of yeah. you know big expectation from the global scale. Um, but I, I think that again, you know, regulatory frameworks uh, and capital markets have a lot to do in that way. In that way, and again, if we don't have you know the appropriate, effective legal regulations, governance, taxes, uh, accounting, you know, frameworks, it's 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 going to be. Um, it's going to be a mess. I mean, it's. it's like yeah, I think I, I think you're right. It's. Um, I think you're right on the governance side because we still don't have a mechanism in place that actually can hold these pledges accountable. So somebody needs to measure the progress, and somebody needs to report the progress on on national national side if you have these ndcs that governments are doing uh, it's one thing but how do you do that on a private side that's a big question well i you know i'm, I'm working with the ieee for a while right now uh, we've been exploring you know different types of standards um in in uh, in playbooks and roadmaps and much more of a on the side of the well-being side uh, which is not yeah. compliant with the gdp at all and, and, and any type of capital markets uh, services but or uh, I mean, environment. Um, we we tried, you know, to understand how we can measure progress, and we see a lot of tools, of course, you know, everywhere around the world, uh, suggesting, you know, measuring ESGs, and you know, exactly what you said earlier about how can we can we attribute and, and allocate um, 
funds in a very specific way or on a very localized way. But again, I, I, I think that the mess with, that we have with the data, um, and as you mentioned also, the fact that we, have, we don't have open governance, um, I mean, it sounds like we're taking more risks than we thought, and that could be really dramatic at some point that we cannot go back. Yeah, and I also think about, you know, all these changes that we want to create. I mean, I did this a couple of years ago. You have this list of 100 corporates, 100 companies around the world that basically represent 71% of all the industrial emissions. And we know who they are and we know who runs them and we know how important they are. So why is it so difficult for us to address this? Uh, it is because these companies are truly and deeply embedded in a way of living and the way how we run basically our economies. So it is, you know, going back to the metrics, it is about going back to, uh, you know, transparency and I think accountability. Uh, that's very important. And that's something that is not discussed. Right. I have one last question, Sasha, and I'm probably yes. going to have another interview, much more technical and, and with a lot of curiosity for the next uh, episode. Um, are you optimistic? Uh, that's a hard question. Uh, look, I'm, 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 of course, optimistic about the, the capacity of the humanity to sort of take on the challenge, but I'm, I'm pessimistic from a point of view that I don't think that we are, we are using the right tools to make this happen so um that's the, the that's the biggest challenge for me yeah well thank you a lot uh, that was a pleasure um but i think that we have you know um probably a lot of it's already dark here <laughs> it's 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 very dark here i can tell you that yeah yeah i know <laughs> Thank you very much, first of all. Um, I appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me know when it's out so we can spin it around. 